I need to talk about our founding because it turns out our founding created the mindset that we're driven by today. Our, our founding is inexorably tied to Queen Elizabeth I. She's our, she's our, our founder. I know you want it to be George, it's not. Here's, here's what Elizabeth I wanted to do. She's one of two monarchs that were kind of close to each other in time that transformed Europe and set Europe on a different course. The other one was Isabella of Castile and Leon. They, uh, they both had similar visions. Isabella created Spain out of nothing. And of course, part of that was the dream of making an empire out of Spain, which of course, she completely does. She invades the kingdom of Granada in January of 1492. A few months later, Columbus is crossing the Atlantic. That event will completely transform the world. One of the things that it does is it allows Europe suddenly to go from a poor backwater part of the world where there wasn't much going on in terms of technology and development, intellectual or otherwise, to suddenly having all this wealth from plundering everything from Argentina to Alaska. <laughs> Those Spaniards were bringing that wealth back to Europe. Elizabeth, her goal is that England will become a global superpower in a hundred or so years, 150 years. She, she thinks she's laying the foundation for something that'll happen long after she's dead. But in the United States, you'd be lucky if a politician thought two years out. Elizabeth has a problem. Her problem is England doesn't have anything worth trading for. I mean, it, it has wool, but this wool isn't like the wool back then because we now know how to make it better and we can wash it now. Back then, you couldn't wash wool because if you washed it, it would shrink. So you stunk like hell. So nobody would want that because you could get cotton and you could wash cotton. And then there was linen and silk. There are alternatives that were abundant on the planet, just not abundant in England because England was too poor to afford linen and you couldn't grow cotton there anyway because the environment's wrong. And so the English had a problem if you're gonna break out and become an empire in 150 years, how do you get the wealth to start the process? On top of that, England had another problem. No matter what it did, there was one thing it absolutely had to have, a navy. Because there's nothing you can do if you're an island and you don't have a navy, right? Like if, if it was Russia, they could just have land armies sweep across and conquer stuff and subjugate people because they didn't have to get off their island, but the English have to get off the island. So before they could do anything, they needed ships. Now you go, well, just cut down a forest. You, they couldn't. And the reason they couldn't is the Romans already did. To build the Roman Navy, the Romans had already cut down the forest in England. And by the way, Turkey and France and a bunch of other European places too. <laughs> that, so the English had forests, but they were small forests with new growth trees that they used to make homes and for firewood purposes. But to build a Navy, you don't want young trees. You need super old trees. For the English, the obvious was solution, the 13 colonies in Canada cross the Atlantic, slaughter the Native Americans, take their land, chop down some trees, build a navy. The problem is to get here, they had to already have a navy. So that wasn't an actual option at that point. She can go to the Swedes and the Russians who have the wood locally that she needs to build ships and buy ships from them. Buy the wood from them. She'll have them push the wood across the North Sea to England, and then England will make its own ships with that wood. So that's how she starts the Navy. So now that she's got the Navy, it's not big. I don't want you thinking like all of a sudden there's this giant English fleet. It's a small Navy, but now that she's got it, she has another problem. What does she want to trade for? The obvious thing for her was cotton. 
And the reason was is because since England already had a wool industry, she thinks it'll be relatively easy to switch from wool to cotton. They're not the same, they're made differently, but it's similar enough, she thinks, the talent is already there with the experience that the transition from wool to cotton won't be too painful. So, the Spanish will provide the means. One of the reasons why Europeans were dressing in wool was because up until 1492, cotton was owned by Muslim states. The big cotton producers were Egypt and India. Well, India was ruled by Mughals, Muslims, and Egypt was ruled by Muslims, the Mamluk. And the Europeans, the Christians, didn't want to trade with Muslims. The Muslims were happy to trade, whatever. So like when the, the most serene Republic of Venice would go ahead and trade with Muslims anyway, they loved to go to Alexandria, Egypt, and, and trade with, with the Egyptian rulers. And they, they, the Muslims were like, yeah, let's trade, why not? Trade's good for the world. But the Christians were like against it because they hated Muslims so much. So they were like, no, we're not gonna trade with them. Well, that meant you're gonna wear wool because India and Egypt, that was it. Well, until Cortez conquers Mexico because it turns out the Aztecs had cotton and it transforms Europe another way because now all of a sudden there's a Christian state that enslaves the Native American population and forces it to grow cotton that can then use that in its industry. The Spanish own Italy and Germany. They can take the cotton, they can send it to Italy and Germany, and they can make it into clothing, send it back to Spain, and then Spain will distribute it. And that's how the Spanish op empire will operate. So that's where Elizabeth comes in. Elizabeth goes, what if we could get that Mexican cotton that slave produced Mexican cotton, bring that back to England, put it into our wool uh, textile industry, switch it over to cotton production. We could probably make cheaper pants and cheaper shirts than the Spanish are. The Spanish shirts will look better because they're made in Italy, but ours will be cheaper. And that's her strategy. She creates privateers. The privateers illegally trade with the Spanish colonists because it's forbidden. Spain does not allow this and they br slowly start bringing back cotton, and it's not enough, so they start doing piracy. You have guys like Sir Francis Drake in the open sea slaughtering Spaniards, and he thinks he's doing God's will. Like, he's not just killing Spaniards because he's, he's trying to steal their stuff because he's a pirate. He actually thinks every time he kills a Spaniard, he makes Jesus happy because he hates Catholics so much. On one of his expeditions, he was off the coast of Cape Hatteras. For those of you who went to American public schools, North Carolina. He's off the coast of North Carolina and he notices something really interesting. What looks like the coast when you're in the Atlantic and you're looking west is not really the coast coast. It's an island shaped like a V. Between the mainland and the barrier island that's V-shaped is a little island called Roanoke. And he tells the queen, he says, look, when you're in the Atlantic passing by Cape Hatteras and you look west, you can't see Roanoke. In fact, you don't have any clue whatsoever that there are two bodies of water back there. I say we set up a secret base on the island so we can make our tr illegal trades with the Spanish colonists more efficient. And she goes, it's genius, let's do it. So in 1587, that's what they do. They send the Roanoke colony. The next year, the English pull off a miracle and sink the Spanish Armada. It's just gone. 95% of the Spanish Armada goes to the bottom of the ocean. Should not have been doable. The English were outnumbered. They were, the Spanish ships were better. The Spanish Marines were better. The Spanish had every advantage and the English prevailed. There is a lesson in that. Stop being arrogant is the lesson. <laughs> Anyway, long story short, they forget about Rona because they're so excited about sinking the Spanish Armada, they don't go back there until the colony is already abandoned. The English will try a second attempt, it's called Carolina. Well, that's not a long story, but I'll save it for another time. They're never heard from again. 
That's all you need to know. We found it in 1990. They were apparently just drunk out of their minds. They somehow sailed between the Bahamas, sailed between Cuba and Florida, and didn't notice any of it. And ended up so off course, they ended up in downtown Houston where they died. <laughs> so, oops. <laughs> that was the 1590s. The English will try again in 1607. It's their third attempt. The queen died in 1603. So this is King James I, the per, her hand-picked successor. Jamestown. So the people who go to Jamestown are different than the people who went to Roanoke and Carolina. One thing, it's just men to Jamestown. But it's a special type of man. They were most, I don't know if mostly is the right name, they were largely from the noble class. They were privileged men. Their goal was to come to the Virginia colony, carve out a chunk of land, walk around, look for gold. They thought the Spanish found so much gold, surely the gold is everywhere. Take that gold, send it back to England, get themselves a mail order bride, of course, and peasants. And then they would become the new nobility for this new chunk of land that was with peasants farming in their name. And then they would send their goods back to Europe to be, to, for trade purposes. The problem is Jamestown was a disaster. Not only do they have starvation, uh, not only do they have cannibalism, look up Jane. <laughs> One of the reasons it's a disaster, the primary reason is, well, there's two reasons it's a disaster. One is the, the men who went were spoiled brats. They couldn't carve out a country f from a chunk of land. They didn't know what work was. They were too privileged. They're walking around with their blunderbuss, shooting Bambi and Thumper, eating nuts and berries, trying to find gold so that they could bring people over to do their work for them. That's not how you do this. And so at the end of the day, the population of people who went to Jamestown set it up for the disaster. The other problem was there's no gold. They're on the wrong side of the continent. They needed to be in California or Nevada or Colorado, but not Virginia. Oops, missed. Landed in the wrong place. Well, but there will be gold because after John Smith stabilizes the colony by doing a military coup and forcibly taking over and turning everybody into a member of the commune so that everybody has to grow food after the famine because I think they lost half the colony and he's like, dude, that sucked. All right, here's how it's going to go. From now on, you'll follow my orders. Or I'll just beat the shit out of you. And the next thing you know, everybody's complying with this tyrant. And then after like, I don't know, six, seven years, he's like, screw this. I'm not rich. There's no gold here. He gets on a ship and heads out. John Rolfe figures it out. He figures out how to make tobacco, something you can market to a large population. Up until John Rolfe, you could get tobacco. The problem was is it wasn't processed, it wasn't cured, which meant every time you took a puff, you'd cough. He figured out how to make it smooth. So yeah, maybe in the beginning when you're first learning how to smoke, you cough, but after a while you don't cough anymore. And, and this may be even more important, to create a consistent flavor. The English now have to ask themselves a question. Here's the question. Do we market tobacco intentionally to our own public? This is the 1610s, they're asking this question. Now you go, yeah, but they didn't know how bad it was. They did. Because by the 1590s, even though it wasn't a widespread marketed good, doctors had already been writing treatises saying, if you smoke tobacco, it will make you sick frequently and it will shorten your life expectancy by the 1590s. So when the English in the 1610s are thinking, what do we do now? We have this deadly narcotic that's really addictive that we could market to our own people. It would generate money. The money would flow across the Atlantic to Virginia and then Virginia wouldn't be a giant money pit where we're losing cash every day. Or we can just let the colony fail. They launched an ad campaign to intentionally addict their own population 
to a deadly narcotic that they knew was a deadly narcotic and became the world's first ever drug dealer empire. Later, they'll upgrade to opium. The reason all of this matters is the following. Think about the prospect of what we're talking about here. So I'm English. I'm poor, rich, middle, who cares? It doesn't matter. I get on a ship. I come to Virginia. If I'm free, they will deed me 40 acres of land. 40 acres of land they don't own. There's a Native American family that owns it. I now have the deed to 40 acres of land that somebody else is using, that is farming. Anyway, I got my blunderbust, I'm walking out, and I see the family of Native Americans farming that land that's mine, and I take a shot at them, they hear the bang, they run, they fight, doesn't matter, the land will be mine. I will take it from them. There's a crop already in the field, which is great, because then at come harvest time, I'm already set. And then I just continue to farm the land. All I need to do is get across the Atlantic. The rest is free, well, except for the ammo. In other words, at some level, the colonial settler project that the British unleash in what will become the United States of America was a wealth transfer scheme. There is no greater asset on the planet than real estate. Land, you can grow food. Land, you can build a house. Land, you can build a factory. Land, you can find gold. Land, you can find coal. You can find oil. Land, 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 land. So to go from having none to suddenly having some with really nothing put into it other than you just happen to be English and you had to commit a little act of violence, that's a remarkable like leap. That's a remarkable jump. But then we added a layer to it. Tobacco is labor intensive. In other words, yeah, I can grow tobacco as a single person, not farming, but I'm putting in a lot of hours. Now, it turns out tobacco at the time, at least, I don't know if it's still true, the tobacco seed was worth more than its weight in gold. So this is gonna make me a lot of money. But if I'm a single farmer out there doing this, it's not really gonna make me a lot of money fast. It's better than growing yams, it's better than growing wheat, it's better than raising chickens, for sure, but it's hard. And then once I have enough money, I'll buy a mule or ox or a horse or something. And then, once I have enough money, I'll bring over an indentured servant. Three, five year, seven year contract. I have a conflict of interest with my indentured servant. <clears throat> In three, five or seven years, they're gonna get their freedom. I have to give them a gift as I let them go. They have every incentive not to work hard for the time they're working for me, but I wanna squeeze every ounce of labor out of them. So it's kind of a violent event, and eventually they just start to run away. It becomes a nuisance. But once we've developed a level of sophistication that we can support this, we start bringing over slaves, which is almost right away. It did not take long before we're bringing over slaves. Think about what an indentured servant or a slave is. So I stole the land from the Native Americans. That was a wealth transfer event. Now I've brought over a slave or an indentured servant, and during the time that they're working for me, I don't compensate them for their labor. So I am literally stealing their life force. I am literally stealing their labor, turning it into tobacco, and then making money off of their labor and giving them nothing except food and rags to dress in and some form of shelter. But then, not only is that a wealth transfer event, there's another one. Tobacco that I'm selling to my customers, that provides no good to my customers. I mean, there's a little bit of a buzz, but it's actually killing my customer. In other words, I'm literally transferring their life force into my pocket by murdering them slowly. So I'm murdering my slaves slowly, stealing their labor. I've stolen the land from the Native Americans and I'm killing my customers and stealing their life force. All so I can become rich.
It's wild. So earlier this year, I was traveling outside of the US and I'm talking to a friend. I asked the friend, I said, what's it like doing business with American corporations? And he went, oh, <laughs> do, yeah, I could tell you. He said, when we do financial stuff, we're like people in the US. We are ruthless, everything is transactional, we're just, just nasty. He said, but we had a really steep learning curve for everything else. He said, because when we're not doing finance, when we're doing business, when we're buying and selling products or services or goods, we have a completely different mindset. And I'm like, oh my God, explain, what do you mean? He goes, okay, so when we're doing a business transaction, we don't see this as a one-off event, we see this as the start of a relationship. Our goal is not to create a contract to sell you a good. Our goal is to create a long-term relationship where we'll still have interactions in the future. And he said, so what would happen is, US business people would come and they'd draw their daggers and they'd negotiate hard for every detail in that contract, like it was life or death. And he said, what we would do is we'd just capitulate to all of it. We'd be like, okay, yeah, we can do that for you. Sure, you want that too? Yeah. And we would just give them the concessions they kept demanding because in our mind, this is the first step in a long-term relationship. And next year when they come back, maybe they won't be so desperate and we'll be able to make a better deal for us. So he said, so we, we take losses just to create the relationship and then we'd never hear from them again. The contract is signed, gone, done. And he goes, yeah, so what we've learned is when we deal with Americans, everything is transactional. There's no humanity involved. We don't. We just know we'll never see them again and that they're going to come in and ask the most outrageous, nonsensical things and we have to bargain really hard. We have to just draw our daggers out and be just as ruthless because there's no long-term benefit to any sacrifice we make for that contract. He said, but we don't have that relationship with anywhere else on the planet. He said, when we deal with Europeans, Europeans have long-term relationship as their goal. He said, but you know what? There's somebody even more extreme than us and then extreme than the Europeans, the Japanese. He said, when the Japanese come over, they want a relationship to the point where they bring their family and they're going to insist that we invite them to our homes for a home-cooked meal, including their family members. And when they come back next year, they expect us to know their children's names. <laughs> and he said, so we love doing business with Japan because they're like us. We're, we're maybe not quite as extreme, but we're really close. Like that's, that's how we want to do business. It's a family event. We're making a long-term relationship that'll last decades. That's how we do business with Europe, with Africa, with Asia, but not US. How did we get there? And the answer is, I just told you. The moment we landed, we saw everything as, how can I transfer wealth from those people into my pocket? everything became a ruthless transaction where we dehumanize the other side. Think about the cruelty of stealing land from a family that's farming and then the cruelty of kidnapping a person and dragging them across the Atlantic in chains where a huge portion of them will just die at sea and then you stick them into a position where there's no possibility for them to better their lives. They just serve you so that you can steal their labor. To make things even weirder, the, co the crops we wanted to grow, tobacco and cotton, are also land intensive, not just labor intensive. They wreck the soil and they wreck it really fast. So if the land, they didn't have the technology to protect the land, it meant we had to go west. The necessity of going west was an was a economic imperative if we're going to maintain the system. 
this idea that we needed to go to the Pacific was built into the moment we started growing tobacco and cotton because we were wrecking the soil. And so that's what we did. We just kept going west. We'll trigger wars, right? George Washington all but starts the Seven Years' War that lasted nine years and is also called the French and Indian War that kills a million people and is fought in every ocean on the planet and was global. Like, there's a land war in Europe. The reason he starts the war is because he wants Kentucky so he can grow tobacco because his family was going bust. They were growing hemp, but they just didn't care to grow hemp. They wanted tobacco. Tobacco is where the money was at. And so they needed to go west. They wanted to get into Kentucky. To end the Seven Years' War, because see, the Brits didn't win it militarily in the beginning. They, they were in serious trouble. They were losing. Queen Elizabeth I's dream was on the verge of ending right then and there. The 13 colonies were going to get wiped out. So the Brits had to make a deal with the Native Americans called the Royal Proclamation of 1763. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 prohibited colonists from crossing the Appalachian Mountains and going west. Well, for those of you who went to American public schools, Kentucky is west. In other words, Washington starts a war to get Kentucky. The Brits don't really win, they, but they do win. They win it by making a deal with the Native Americans that will prohibit Washington and people like him from going to Kentucky. In that moment, they planted the seeds of the revolution. Because in that moment then, the southern plantation owners are host. How are they going to get to the land that's west of the Appalachians as long as the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is in place? So they're angry. They start trying to come up with a way to get rid of this Royal Proclamation. And then the commoners provide them the source. Long story short, commoners are mad because the English Bill of Rights guarantees you representation in Parliament if you're taxed. So George III needs to collect taxes from the colonies, not because England was going to make a lot of money off those taxes. Those taxes were really light. The tea tax is my favorite. Okay, so let's say we do in today dollars, uh, what, five cents per tea bag in tax? How much tea are you drinking? Like if you drink two tea bags worth of tea a day, that's 10 cents a day, that's $36.50 a year. You're gonna start a revolution because you're mad about a $36 tax? Once the commoners are out upset because they don't have representation in parliament, it's just a matter of time before the elites realize they have a way to break the royal proclamation. Now think about this. You or your family members came over, you got land that wasn't yours, you got labor that wasn't yours that you didn't really pay for, you're making money off of cotton, which is nice, or tobacco, which is evil, you're wrecking the soil, but you're still filthy rich. Even if you're growing hemp because you can't grow tobacco because you've wrecked the soil, you're living off of your inheritance. It's not like you're working hard. It's not like your life is hard and mean. So even the colonists who are upset about not having representation in parliament, that's an ego thing at that point. Who cares? What were we going to get? Three, three representatives per colony? There were 17, not 13 at that moment. So what would that have been, 51 people? added to a body of 600? Or were we going to get two representatives per colony? Like it wasn't going to have a meaningful impact on the types of laws being generated in England. It wasn't going to affect your day-to-day -day life very much. In other words, we got really mad about something that symbolically was important to us, but in reality wasn't going to have a big impact on us. And then the elites used that anger to turn the revolution from a revolution to fight for our English rights into a revolution for independence because the United States of America doesn't have to pay attention to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. We can cancel it, slaughter the Native Americans, take Kentucky, bring tobacco and slaves over, and begin the process again until we destroy Kentucky. And then I guess we have to move to Missouri and do it to Missouri. 
And then they didn't know how far west they could go because they didn't realize you probably aren't going to grow much tobacco in Kansas. But that was the dream, was to grow tobacco all the way to Alaska and California. Just keep going west, right through the Rocky Mountains. In other words, what we've got now is a transactional society that now views other people as a means for generating wealth, which is, of course, the foundation of capitalism. Instead of seeing another person as a person who's a member of your community, you see the other person as an opportunity to make a profit. And that, of course, creates this transactional society that we've become a part of and that we're familiar with. So there's an irony of all of this. Adam Smith writes The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations is right, the book that codifies the birth of capitalism. It's published in 1776. It's not a coincidence. Our birth and the birth of capitalism are inextricably tied together. The way we design the Constitution reflects that. By the time we get through the Constitution, it is clear that our objective, Madison says this, it is clear that our objective is to create a hierarchical society. It was their objective from the beginning. John Locke, the Scottish philosopher who wrote the second treatise on government, the guy who wrote the English Bill of Rights, he's the author of the Constitution of the Carolinas when the Carolinas were being established by royal charter. When he wrote that Constitution, he doesn't just add slavery into it. He made it so that it was all but impossible to ever abolish it. We made it so that we're going to create an electoral republic. Think about the mechanism here. When you run for office, you can be campaign financed. You receive money, and then you take that money and you use it on your campaign to get elected. In other words, if you don't do what your donors want you to do, in two years, they're going to fund somebody else, and that money isn't going to be used by you to get elected. It's going to be used by an opponent of yours to take you out. So at that point now, as a politician, you've become captive to your donors. In other words, what we did by creating an electoral republic is we gave the merchants the reins. We gave the rich the reins because they campaign finance the politicians. And they can take out politicians by campaign financing their opponents. And that became our political system. So the laws that we generated were laws that were generated to benefit the rich by design. Madison says it in a letter to his friend. He says, I designed a constitution that would leave the power in the hands of the rich. Don't worry, support this thing. 